Chiron's parents arrived at the mansion, reuniting after two years apart. Chiron shared the details of his experiences, and Vincent became emotional, realizing that his son wasn't just imagining things. Suddenly, Bishop appeared, accompanied by Rian and Reyna. The astonished couple warmly greeted them, struggling to accept that Chiron's account was indeed true. They were treated as honored guests and had the opportunity to meet Clump as well. Bishop then revealed their plan to send Chiron to the Alpia's Magic Academy, emphasizing his talent. However, a complication arose. Chiron was considered a commoner. In response, Clump offered to adopt Chiron. Vincent was taken aback by the idea that Chiron would become a noble, but he also recognized that his son would be taken away from him. He looked at Chiron, who strongly opposed the idea. Reyna clarified that it would only be for the sake of official documents, but Chiron remained resolute, choosing to live as a commoner even if it meant sacrificing his dreams. Clump was astonished by Chiron's determination, but Vincent, in a surprising turn, asked Clump to adopt Chiron. Vincent admitted that Chiron was not their real son, explaining that they had found him and were convinced that he belonged to a noble family. Their intention was to adopt him into a noble household, ensuring his return to where he truly belonged. Bishop, noticing the difference in appearance between Chiron and his supposed parents, confronted Vincent about it. Chiron, already aware of the truth, shouted at Vincent and expressed his fear of being abandoned once again. Overwhelmed with emotion, Vincent embraced Chiron and offered a sincere apology. Witnessing his son Rian in tears, Bishop asked his father to inquire about Chiron's admission to Alfia's academy, which had a special enrollment process. Although Clump expressed concerns about approaching Alfia's, Bishop reminded him of a debt they owed, prompting Clump to decide on a reckless course of action. Three days later, Rian tearfully expressed his sorrow at parting ways with Chiron, urging him to become a mage while pledging to become the strongest knight to protect him. Reyna intervened by punching Rian and insisting that he should graduate first. Reyna assured Chiron that their grandfather would ensure his attendance at the Magic Academy, and regarded him as a caring and resilient younger brother. Finally, she wished him good luck. With Rian, Reyna, and Rai boarding a carriage bound for the capital, Chiron, and his family prepared to return to their home. Rian shouted, encouraging Chiron to surpass everyone in the Magic Academy, to which Chiron responded with the same request. Meanwhile, Clump met with Alphias and provided a description of Chiron, mentioning his resemblance to Alphias during his younger years. Alphias expressed confidence in admitting Chiron, but Clump informed him that Chiron was not of noble lineage. Alphias then inquired if they were referring to the child with blonde hair and blue eyes. Clump explained to Alphias about their attempt to adopt Chiron in the past. Alphias understood Chiron's way of thinking, which Clump believed was similar to Alphias's own thinking. However, Alphias expressed concern, stating that such thinking could be dangerous. Clump urged Alphias to forgive himself for past events. Alphias revealed that he had taken up teaching magic to children to prevent someone like himself from emerging. Clump informed him that fate had brought back the child he had once driven away, and Alphias ultimately decided to accept Chiron. Three months later, Chiron, now 17 years old, bid farewell to his loving parents. Temurin arrived to accompany Chiron to the academy. After hours of travel, they reached the academy, and Chiron expressed gratitude to Temurin for everything. Temurin cautioned him, saying that even a talented commoner would still be considered a commoner. However, Chiron was encouraged to persevere and make the most of the opportunity provided by the academy. They entered the academy building, and Temurin left Chiron's side. Soon after, Alphias arrived, and they recognized each other. Alphias instructed Chiron to prepare for an unexpected test, feeling regretful that he had not been able to teach Chiron earlier. Alphias then showed Chiron around the academy. They visited the beginner class, where children were practicing various types of magic. They proceeded to the high rank class, where teenagers engaged in discussions on complex subjects and performed more advanced magical experiments. Chiron felt like he had entered a completely different world. At that moment, they walked past a familiar red-haired girl, who caught their attention. Chiron stumbled upon a notice board that displayed the names of the top performing students and their aspirations. Upon glancing at it, he felt a desire to challenge them. Suddenly, a voice called out the name of the highest ranking student from the advanced class, Karmus Amy. Chiron turned his gaze in her direction and immediately recognized her from their past encounters. In return, Amy looked back at him, and Sariel caught up to her. 
Chiron hoped fervently that he would go unnoticed. However, Amy's friend became infatuated with Chiron. Amy mentioned that he seemed familiar, leading Seriel to assume that Amy was now interested in boys. Karmus Amy was renowned for rejecting all suitors, and now, someone who knew her dark past was joining the academy. Alphias and Chiron arrived at the testing center, where children underwent evaluations of their spirit zones. These assessments determined their class assignments based on their ability to manipulate the spirit zone. Alphias advised Chiron to truthfully answer all the questions. When Chiron's turn arrived, he stepped into his spirit zone. The evaluators asked him to state the farthest number he could see, but Chiron chose to remain silent. Alphias urged him to be honest, so he confessed that he could indeed perceive a number, but it was excessively long, making it unreadable. Furthermore, the number kept growing longer as time passed. Chiron examined the number in front of him and decided to truncate it to 3.14. However, the teachers insisted that they hadn't set that particular number. Chiron persisted in his claim, prompting one of the teachers to realize that he might have exceeded their preset limit of 30 meters. Moreover, Chiron stated that he could perceive the color blue, which was deemed impossible for someone with a large spirit zone. Alphias finally understood why Klump had recommended Chiron. He realized that Chiron possessed an extraordinary and abnormal talent. To make matters more concerning, Chiron also claimed to sense and see 867 balls within his zone, leaving the teachers utterly astonished. Alphias perceived this revelation as potentially dangerous. His overall assessment is written down, and he is asked to wait outside while they discuss what to do with Chiron. They have a debate about which class to assign him to because Chiron's assessment shows he has advanced skills but lacks the basics. Eventually, they decide to place him in class 7. The classes are divided into different levels, Basic classes for classes 10 to 8, advanced classes for classes 7 to 4, and graduating classes for classes 3 to 1. The following day, Chiron introduces himself to his new classmates in class 7, and they become excited to have a new student. The lessons are challenging, but Chiron is determined to catch up somehow. The history books he read previously proved to be helpful in his studies. In the afternoon, the classes participate in combined training for the advanced level. On the training grounds, Amy remains as popular as ever, and Chiron tries his best to avoid her. Romy Atella, an instructor specializing in the advanced spirit zone, takes charge of the class. She mentions that a new student will be joining them that day. Chiron introduces himself, and everyone enthusiastically greets him. Seriel becomes particularly excited, while Amy has a moment of realization. She recalls her troubled past and cannot help but express her frustration and anger through a swear word. Her classmates overheard her and were taken aback by what they heard. Amy was unable to believe that she was going to meet him again. She felt ashamed and embarrassed about her past actions. She envisioned Chiron spreading the word about how Amy had commanded gangsters and even stripped him of his clothes. Amy knew she had to take action regarding Chiron, who was feeling uneasy about the situation. At that moment, Itella stood in the image zone and explained the practicality of the spirit zone in battles, along with its limitations. She also discussed the four different forms of the spirit zone, defense, attack, cross, and the detached form, which was the most challenging to maintain once it separated from the body. Suddenly, Itella asked Amy to demonstrate the cross form for combat. However, Amy was not keen on drawing any attention to herself at that particular moment. Amy executed the cross form with agility, swiftly demolishing the targets as she spun on her spot. Chiron, observing her performance, admired her graceful movements. Upon finishing, Amy glanced at Chiron, and to her embarrassment, she realized that everyone had witnessed her actions. Chiron trembled, and both individuals became certain that they recognized each other from the past. Amy devised a plan to silence Chiron about her previous experiences. Later, during the class, each student underwent individual training for the defensive form. Chiron pondered about the technique and successfully executed it. He approached Atella and requested the utilization of the image zone. The anticipation of witnessing Chiron's skills grew among the onlookers. He summoned his spirit zone, and its size surpassed the average limit. However, the expanded spirit zone ultimately collapsed due to its unfamiliar dimensions. Determined, Chiron resolved to stretch his spirit zone even further. To the astonishment of everyone, Chiron's spirit zone reached an impressive length of 41 meters. He skillfully controlled the zone, condensing it into a denser defensive form. Excitement filled the air 
as both the instructor and the classmates anticipated his success, except for Amy. She believed that Chiron's progress would soon surpass her own, leading to her humiliation. She intended to take action regarding him. Itella praises Chiron's performance, and the other students congratulate him. He captures attention as a competitor, an object of admiration, a source of jealousy, and a menacing stare. The following day, Sienna Alifer elucidates that a magician transforms into a deity while inside their spirit zone. Through her explanations, Chiron comprehends why he is unable to utilize magic. He is attempting to possess unlimited power without acquiring all-encompassing knowledge. He realizes that he can become a magician. That afternoon, Chiron is forcefully taken to the nearby forest. Chiron becomes perplexed, and Amy threatens him that she intends to end his life. Amy became hesitant when she noticed Chiron's determined expression. He confirmed that he remembered her past. Amy clarified that there was a misunderstanding and she wasn't a promiscuous girl, which surprised Chiron. She further explained that it was the gangsters who wanted to humiliate him. Chiron now understood that Amy was worried about rumors spreading about her past. He advised her to simply apologize and emphasize that dwelling on the past would be futile. However, Amy misunderstood his intentions and believed that Chiron intended to act superior to her after the apology. She expressed her disadvantage, fearing that Chiron could still spread rumors even after she apologized. Amy then threatened him, implying the difficulties he would face in the academy. Chiron recognized this as her personality. Amy warned him that if he offended a senior, the other seniors and underclassmen in her class would turn against him, potentially leading to his expulsion. Chiron realized that Amy aimed to make him drop out to prevent rumors from spreading. Amy decided to test his trustworthiness and requested that Chiron bring her coffee every morning. With no other choice, Chiron agreed to be her messenger. Amy cautioned him not to report her to the teachers, threatening to harm him, and then left abruptly. The following morning, Chiron attracted attention as he delivered Amy's coffee. Amy smirked as she received the coffee and left Chiron embarrassed. She claimed that she was merely disciplining her junior, but deep down, she felt a sense of accomplishment. Chiron perceived this as bullying but remained steadfast and carried out his tasks. Ten days later, Chiron began to gather his own audience every morning and earned the nickname, Academy's Romanticist. Rumors circulated that he had been confessing his feelings for ten consecutive days. Amy encountered Chiron and noticed the growing crowd around him. She had believed that her bullying was effective, but Sariel asked Amy when she would accept Chiron. Sariel explained the current rumors, and Amy realized her mistake. While the audience cheered for Chiron, he delivered Amy's coffee. Chiron only wanted her to take it so he could go study, but Amy became flustered and blushed with confusion. The students cheered loudly when Chiron brought coffee to Amy. Amy, who realized what was happening, became angry and pushed the coffee away. She then acted like a girl who was being confessed to and completely rejected Chiron in front of everyone. Amy left, and Sariel asked her if she was worried about the rumors. The audience thought Chiron was heartbroken, but in reality, he was actually celebrating. That night, Amy felt depressed because she had started a rumor on her own. She had been saving all the pictures of Chiron delivering coffee using the Karmas family's red-eye device. At first, it was amusing for her, but for nine days, Chiron didn't show any reaction, and his eyes didn't even move. Amy wondered how Chiron could hide his true feelings. Chiron seemed like someone who could control his emotions like a machine or someone who was genuinely sincere. Amy tried to go to bed, and Sariel asked if she was feeling unwell because she hadn't received Chiron's coffee. Her plan had failed, so now she intended to rest. Just then, Jake Adrius confronted her. He claimed that he had heard about a poor kid who kept bothering her. Jake offered her a cup of high-quality coffee and said that he was also trying to court her. He stated that he was better than a poor kid like Chiron. Amy looked disgusted and told him to stop joking around. Amy knew that Jake's research group was trying to undermine her. Jake denied it and told her not to disrespect him because it was the same as disrespecting his family. Amy then called him pathetic. She further stated that their strange research group only bullied other children and had no honor whatsoever. Jake became offended and furious. He claimed that his family had enough power to eliminate a family like the Karmas. Amy laughed at Jake, realizing that he had cowardly eyes, unlike Chiron. This comparison angered Jake even more. He admitted that he had done things in the wrong order and should have dealt with Chiron first. 
Amy flinched and broke the cup of coffee. Jake became angry and found himself trapped in Amy's spirit zone. Amy ominously asked Jake what he was trying to achieve. Jake reminded Amy about the school policy, and Amy laughed, calling Jake a coward who relied on his family's influence. Jake realized he was in a difficult situation and had no choice but to flee. Amy couldn't believe she had gotten so worked up over Chiron being falsely accused. She just wanted to clear her head. Several days had passed since Chiron felt relieved that Amy's bullying had come to an end. However, his tranquility was interrupted when he noticed Sariel in a state of panic. Concerned, Chiron approached her, causing Sariel to become even more anxious. She questioned his presence and urgently asked about Amy. In a rush, she thrust a letter into Chiron's face, revealing that some students had apparently taken him captive. Just half an hour earlier, a male student had attempted to deliver a letter to Amy, only to be ignored. The student expressed concern for Chiron's safety. Amy snatched the letter from him and read its contents, declaring her indifference. Sariel grew worried and suggested informing a professor. However, Amy feared that the school authorities would thoroughly investigate the matter, potentially uncovering their relationship and Chiron's lower social status. She recalled witnessing a young Chiron crawling on the ground, imagining the past and the present moment. Amy flinched and handed her bag over to Sariel, asserting that Jake's group posed no threat to her before departing. Chiron found it hard to believe that someone as wicked as Amy would now be the one to save him. Overwhelmed by panic, Chiron contemplated his next move, but Sariel urged him to wait as instructed by Amy. Chiron understood the reason behind Amy's reluctance to involve the professors. He confided in Sariel, expressing his intention to follow her lead. Chiron devised a plan to escape, yet Sariel swiftly intervened, grasping hold of him. She informed him that they would utilize photonization, and suddenly they teleported to a secluded forest. Descending from their airborne position, they scoured the area but found no sign of anyone. Chiron speculated that Amy had been taken to an even more remote location. Realizing the urgency of the situation, Chiron instructed Sariel to inform the professors while admitting that he was the cause of this incident. Sariel became frantic and questioned whether the rumors about their secret relationship were true. Chiron urged her to leave immediately, letting out a sigh before expanding his spiritual senses. In doing so, he detected some traces and heard an explosion nearby. The explosion happened because a student threatened Amy. At that moment, more students arrived, and Jake appeared. Jake couldn't believe that Amy came to help Chiron. Amy asked where Chiron was, and everyone laughed and said that Chiron was probably in the library. They had called Amy out as a form of revenge. Amy was relieved that Chiron wasn't there. She smiled and confidently declared that she would take care of them. Jake suddenly felt afraid. Without warning, Amy launched an attack, causing flames to burn some of the students. Jake instructed them to scatter because the cross formation was weak in battle. Unfortunately, some of them were hit and fell down. Amy asked where they thought they were going, and she locked onto everyone, launching attacks in all directions. Amy was able to switch her tactics quickly. Jake couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was different from what he had witnessed in class. He positioned himself above Amy, knowing it was the blind spot of the cross formation. He cast a magic spell, but Amy effortlessly dodged it. Jake was shocked, and Amy laughed at him. She retaliated and shot Jake down. Although he landed with a protective barrier, Amy continued to rain magic attacks upon him. Amy taunted him, calling him pathetic. Suddenly, Amy's magic was interrupted, and she began experiencing intense headaches as she found herself surrounded. Jake stated that it was checkmate. His group was using anti-magic techniques to suppress Amy. Amy accused him of being a coward for resorting to forbidden magic. Jake then used wind magic to bind Amy, making it impossible for her to escape. Amy struggled but couldn't break free. Jake pulled out a knife and threatened to mark Amy's face. Excitedly, he demanded that she beg for her life. At that moment, Amy realized that this was how Chiron must have felt when they were kids. Just as things seemed hopeless, someone shouted at them to stop. Amy looked to the side and saw Chiron. Chiron appeared unexpectedly, surprising everyone. Jake's group found it amusing to see Amy's prince all alone. Chiron devised a plan to buy some time and urged them to release Amy. With determination, he rushed forward, only to find them standing idle. Suddenly, Chiron experienced the debilitating effects of anti-magic, causing him immense pain, and he collapsed to the ground. 
This provoked laughter from everyone, while Amy instructed them to eliminate Chiron's spirit zone. The sensation of losing his senses and his mind breaking apart overwhelmed Chiron. He recalled a previous conversation about a defensive technique capable of nullifying mental attacks. Despite the agony caused by the anti-magic, Chiron endeavored to endure it, while Jake's group intensified their efforts. Amy urged him to surrender, but then they witnessed Chiron's defensive form neutralizing the anti-magic. Determined, Chiron continued to reinforce his defense form, causing Jake's group to become flustered. Rising to his feet, Chiron advanced towards them, and the anti-magic began reflecting back at the group, affecting them as well. Amy, finally freed from the windbind, was astonished to discover the existence of a chilling and impenetrable spirit zone. In disbelief that they were outnumbered, Jake accused Chiron of specializing in anti-magic, which explained his special recommendation. Jake proclaimed his determination not to lose in a battle and focused his attention on Chiron. He conjured his wind magic, but before he could cast it, Amy delivered a powerful punch to him. Amy continued to pummel Jake mercilessly, prompting Chiron to intervene and try to calm her down. Poor Jake endured a severe beating, and Chiron managed to lift Amy, but both of them tumbled to the ground, resulting in Amy losing consciousness atop Chiron. Chiron was startled when he saw Amy losing consciousness while she was on top of him. He felt flustered and thanked Amy for coming to his aid. However, Amy flinched and quickly got up, hitting Chiron in the process. She called him weak, causing Chiron to believe that she didn't have any positive qualities. Despite this, Amy helped Chiron stand so they could escape without the professors finding out. Chiron informed her that he had asked Sariel to inform the professors. Amy's head started to ache, and she asked Chiron about the possibility of their secret being revealed. Unbeknownst to them, Jake overheard their conversation just as they were planning to flee. Suddenly, Professor Thad and Professor Sienna arrived, accompanied by Sariel, who immediately checked on Amy. Thad illuminated the area and discovered the unconscious students. He questioned Amy, wondering why such an excellent student like her would end up in that situation. Sienna, on the other hand, found Chiron's behavior suspicious and directed her inquiry towards him. It was at that moment that Jake appeared and offered to explain everything. He claimed that they had engaged in a duel. However, Sienna had already found a piece of evidence indicating their use of anti-magic, which Jake dismissed as a mere countermeasure. According to his version of events, Amy had attacked them first, and they had requested a duel in self-defense. Amy called Jake crazy for kidnapping Chiron, but nothing had actually happened to him. Jake accused Amy and Chiron of hiding something because they hadn't initially informed the professors. He threatened to expose their secret and intended to exploit it along with his wealth. Sienna intervened, silencing Jake, and reiterated that they had violated school policy. She emphasized that the use of anti-magic could lead to severe mental harm and loss of control. Sienna believed this to be sufficient grounds for expulsion. Jake scoffed at the idea of a mere professor threatening him, reminding Thad that his family sponsored the school. However, Sienna remained steadfast in her role as an instructor. Jake laughed and threatened Sienna and her position as a teacher. In response, Sienna attacked Jake with ice magic, prompting Thad to remind her not to harm a student fatally. Jake found himself trapped within ice and ice spikes. Chiron was amazed by Sienna's mastery of her magic. Sienna warned Jake that money couldn't solve everything and dispelled her magic. She revealed that the school was already aware of the harm he had inflicted on numerous students, and this time, they wouldn't hold back in punishing him. Sienna declared that teachers imparted knowledge that couldn't be bought with money. She reminded Jake of his aspirations of becoming a mage and urged him not to cast aside those dreams. Realizing the gravity of his actions, Jake apologized to Sienna. Chiron also recalled what was truly important to him. Later, Amy and Chiron faced interrogation regarding their delay in reporting the incident to the teachers. Amy decided to tell the truth, knowing that they couldn't keep everything a secret indefinitely. To everyone's surprise, Amy confessed that Chiron was her boyfriend. The room was filled with astonishment at this revelation. That concludes part 3 of this recap. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. What will happen next? If you would like to see a part 4 of this manhwa, let us know in the comments section below. Till next time.